Thomas Edison's first cylinder phonograph in 1877 started a chain of recording inventions that have led directly to today's advanced digital technology with quality unimagined in Edison's time. Among the important pioneers in audio and video recording history, John T. Mullen stands out. In addition to advancing the art and science of entertainment technology, he is a noted collector and media historian. Jack will now walk us through over 100 years of recording illustrating the story with his extensive collection of audio devices and rare documents. Join us for an afternoon with Jack Mullen. What we're going to do first is, I think, start with sort of taking it all the way back to the beginning. Uh, where'd you come from? It's a pretty personal question. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I was born in 1913 in San Francisco, and um, lived in my grandmother's house on Franklin Street. My mother and father rented a room from her. In the early days, times weren't very good. But anyway, I was about three years old when they moved from there. But before they moved, I remember my father bought a little, what was called a Victrola, but it was a table model. And you will actually see that model in the next room. Um, 1915 model. And uh, I think I was intrigued by this thing. Well, anyway, nowadays, I'm fortunate enough to be able to have apparatus that goes back to the beginnings of sound recording. And this happens to be an exact copy of Edison's first sound recorder, which he did by wrapping tinfoil around this drum, then turning the drum, and having a diaphragm with a needle contact the tinfoil he shouted in here, Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. And that's all the time he had to record on that cylinder. Then he wound this back, moved off the thing that he'd shouted into, and moved this one up against it, with the needle again, against the tinfoil, and lo and behold, he heard his voice. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Well, in a few years, Edison had uh, developed his uh, device to be quite commercial, and he had perfected a sort of a wax cylinder that uh, uh, you could record on, and then he introduced commercial cylinders, which were harder and lasted longer than the wax, and were pre-recorded with music. Here's an example, and I'll put it on this little machine that was made in 1906. Let you hear a little of it. It's, it's amazingly good for its age. Anyway, that gives you an idea of what sound in the home was like if you didn't do it live. The only mechanical method of reproducing sound was on machines like that. The Berliner people came along and developed the flat disc, and by about 1895 or 96, it was a commercial success. By about uh, 1905, it was doing very well, and here's what we had. isn't too bad, you know. That is what was known as a Zonophone machine. That was a competitor to Berliner, the man who really invented the flat disc. But the Berliner interests uh, wound up with the name Victor because they were in a, a, a legal entanglement with this Zonophone guy, and uh, they won the battle. So they called the company the Victor Company, and that was the beginning of Victor, or as, of course, we know it today, RCA Victor. Just give you a smattering of that. and so on, but we won't bother with the rest of these. The main thing is that they all sounded pretty much alike, and that was a pretty tinny sound. Uh, through all this uh, period of time up to about 1924, the phonograph continued to sound as tinny, almost as it had at its outset. In 1915, this was a common machine that was made. This happened to have been my wife's aunt's machine in New Haven, Connecticut. And uh, here's how it sounds today, just as it did in 1915. You wouldn't want to listen to it very long.
Now we have to remember how that sounded because the next thing I want to show you is what happened in 1925, the greatest transition in the history of sound recording. The end result was this machine that I'm going to demonstrate now, and we have it right over here. The machine that I mention is uh, this one. This is the 1925 revolution in sound recording. What we've been listening to, the last one, was a Victrola, the very common name. Everybody had a Victrola if they could afford it in their homes in the 1920s, early 1920s. But in 1925, this machine came into being, and it is a sensation by comparison with what you just heard. This, again, is a Victrola. These were all made by Victor. From what you just heard to this, I think you'll admit it's quite a transition, and then I'll explain why. The reason that it is such a sensational improvement in sound is because it was designed by Bell Telephone Laboratories. The people in Victor and Columbia and those other companies had always just sort of arbitrarily decided how they would make the mechanical and the acoustic end of their phonographs, but they didn't really understand acoustics and they didn't understand the design parameters that went into really uh, the, the possibility of designing something that would cover a wide band of frequencies. Now the telephone company people knew that because they'd been transmitting uh, telephone conversations over long distances and so on and they had learned that uh, there were a mechanical uh, equivalents of electrical circuits and they put that to, to work and they were able to design mechanical things using what they learned elect from electrical uh, theory and this is the, the heart of this machine the needle vibrates a diaphragm of aluminum which has a dome on it they recognized that that dome was important. All the other machines earlier than this had a flat mica diaphragm, just a sheet of mica. They didn't know how to go from there, but the telephone people did. So this was part of the design. Then they coupled that to a horn that was folded back and forth inside the cabinet so that it had great length. And it expanded according to what is known as an exponential shape. Well, along with it, of course, they had to have better records because the old records were made by that same acoustic method of singing or shouting into a horn and uh, causing the uh, sound to be collected by the horn and then that at the apex of the horn would vibrate a little diaphragm and wiggle a stylus that cut the wax and put the sound on the record. That was a pretty crude way of doing it, but it was all they had until this system came along. The elements of this electric recording system then were the condenser microphone, amplifier tubes, and this specially designed cutter for recording the records. This display is rather interesting here in that it shows an orchestra set up in the Camden studios of the Victor Company uh, in this picture approximately 1923. Over here is the same orchestra in the same studio in 1925. The big horn that was used in the old acoustic method to pick up the sound and record what they could. The horn gathered what it could and uh, it was uh, extremely difficult to get a good level on the record. So they had to crowd the musicians up close to the horn. They put them on tiers and they had to put an amplifier on the violin. Now by amplifier I mean a horn. There were no electric amplifiers of course. Again the idea is to use the horn to intensify the sound. All the violins had these funny little horns on them which really distorted the sound of a violin of course but they were called a stro violin. Uh, so you had all these musicians crowded here. Then when they put the microphone in they could spread the musicians out so that they were comfortable and in the much more normal or natural positions. This display shows at one time the sound of the acoustic recording and then it switches over to the sound of the electric recording and the orchestra is playing the same piece in both cases so that it's intercut from this record, the acoustic record, 
to this one, which is the electric record. Now, having satisfied themselves and uh, sold this package to Victor and Columbia and other people in the recording business, the Victor, or rather the Bell Labs people, turned their attention, which they'd had in the back of their minds all the time probably, to the great prospect of making talking motion pictures. And the machine that they developed for recording this uh, sound for talkies was this apparatus here. This is the beginning of the talking pictures. Now, of course, in the motion picture studios, you'd have uh, uh, stages where the action took place, but the sound was always recorded in the sound department, and that would be a special area that was equipped with a number of machines like this. First thing they did was decide that they had to be able to run continuously on a record for 11 minutes. All the phonograph records prior to this time ran at 78 RPM, and the 12 inch records were capable of running for four and a half minutes at the most. So here was a problem, how to get 11 minutes off of a phonograph record. So they decided that they needed a new speed, slower speed, and a larger disc. So that's where this size of the disc and the 33 and a third RPM came from. And that's what this machine does. It runs at 33 and a third and records, and incidentally, from the inside out, because they used steel needles to play the records in those days, and when you would start a record in the theater, you'd use a fresh needle every time, and starting in the inside, the velocity of the groove is low, the needle is sharp. When you get to the outside, the needle is worn, but the velocity is up and compensates for the loss of high frequencies that would result from the wear of the needle. The big disc that you've been seeing here is actually wax, and you'll notice it's very thick. These wax discs were cast and then very carefully shaved and polished on the top surface by a high spinning machine, high, high rate of spin with a, a special blade then they, that made, the, made them prepared with a mirror-like surface for cutting the groove by the recording device. After that, they were taken off and put in a bath and electroplated, and from there on the process was very much like we have today in making records where the electroplated thing was peeled away from the wax. Then they would send it to the shaving room and the top would be shaved again, removing any uh, remaining semblance of grooves and repolishing it. And this went on until the wax got thinner and thinner and was now vulnerable to breakage. And so that's why they started out with the thick cake and kept using it until it was too thin. Of course, all this development by uh, Bell Telephone Laboratories for electric recording for the phonograph and for talking pictures uh, was introduced between 1925 and 1926, along in that era. Prior to that, the phonograph had gone into a tremendous decline in the home and the phonograph people uh, that manufactured machines were very worried until that great change occurred that we've seen. What happened was uh, people weren't buying records anymore or machines for a very good reason. There was a thing called radio that came into uh, prominence in the early 1920s and people were buying little things like this. Here is a one tube radio and a pair of earphones and that's all you needed in order to hear what was happening at the local radio station of which there might be only one. But it was free and the program was constantly changing. You never heard the same thing twice. So radio had taken over, and a lot of local stations found that the music on phonograph records was far superior to anything that they could provide, and so many of them immediately jumped into playing phonograph records. And even stations that tried to concentrate on live broadcasting would succumb to playing records at certain hours. Uh, in the live broadcasting, I have some memories of that. For example, in San Francisco, 
Uh, it was typical in the afternoon to pick up the palm court of the Palace Hotel Salon Orchestra playing selections by Victor Herbert and so on in the afternoon uh, at tea time. And it was interesting that uh, one time, long time ago, I saw in front of the orchestra this microphone. This is really getting into class. This was an announcer's microphone, and this microphone was used in places such as the Palm Court, where a, the broadcasting station wanted to make a good impression in front of the audience at tea time or at evening concerts or even in dance pavilions, such as the so-called Balconades Ballroom in San Francisco. This was a very common microphone, but that was sort of chintzy alongside of this. But however, there weren't very many of these ever made. In order to uh, ease their problem in broadcasting in such stations, somebody got a great idea, and that was why not make records specially for broadcasting? In other words, pre-recorded programs. And they had a great tool at their disposal. That Vitaphone record that I've told you about that played for 11 minutes, it was possible to push the grooves closer together and get 15 minutes on one side. And that became what was known as the electrical transcription or transcribed radio program. This came into being about 1929. It lasted all through World War II and was the main means of preparing programs in advance for broadcast. There were other methods tried, but none of them were very successful. The good old disc was the most practical and remained. Now, at the end of the war, the Armed Forces Radio Service had been doing a lot of preparing of programs for the Armed Forces records of this sort to be sent overseas. And what they had often done was take commercial programs that were put on the air during the war by the networks, record them, and then re-record, eliminating the commercials. Now, the artists got wise to that, and they understood, uh, rightly, that it was possible to edit from disc to disc. And after the war was over, Bing Crosby decided that if he was going to go back on the air permanently with a sponsor such as Philco, who wanted him very badly, he did not want to have to go live. So he said, if I'm going back on the air, I want to pre-record my programs and edit them as need be, and then I won't have to worry. I can just do whatever I like uh, in the program as it's presented, and somebody else will clean it up for me. So ABC permitted him to do that, and uh, starting in 1946 for Philco, he was recording his radio programs, and they were being edited this way. And the results were not very good because in the re-recording process, by the time you went from an original to a second generation and maybe a third generation because of difficult editing problems, the fidelity was very definitely off. So it was essential that the Crosby people look around for something else. Uh, they tried sound on film. They even thought in terms of magnetic recording, but magnetic recording uh, supposedly had not advanced uh, even to the stage of a phonograph record in fidelity during the war. There was a development by the Armour Research Foundation in Chicago with regard to wire recording or magnetic recording. The uh, Armour Research people had done this and one of the products that they had made for the military applications was this machine here. It did not propose to be a high fidelity machine and it was impossible to make it such, but I'm going to let you hear a little of it anyway. And so on, but that fidelity is certainly not as good as what you could get from a disc. So that was wiped out. Just before the invasion of uh, the continent, I was working uh, late at night, and we used to listen to the radio and um, uh, listen to the BBC, and uh, this uh, particular project made me work a few nights in a row there, and each night the BBC went off around midnight, but we were working on into the morning, and uh, we'd tune around and find broadcasts from Germany and we hear these orchestras going so beautifully, you know, 
and uh, they would segue from one number to another so you knew it was continuous music it wasn't just records and anyhow uh, by now I was I thought I was pretty familiar with what all types of recording were uh, film and disc and uh, whatever I hadn't played around with wire but everybody knew wire of magnetic recording was no good so why fool with that but anyway um, <clears throat> This sounded superb, and um, we thought probably Hitler must be having people work all night. Uh, our outfit moved to the continent shortly after the invasion, and uh, we took up residence in Paris as soon as it was possible to get in that city and established, now I was with the Signal Corps, I was back in the American Army now and away from the RAF and so on. And um, we set up an office in Paris. Well, it had all kinds of big rooms in it, and. Um, we were able to use these as labs and laboratories and things for the kind of work we were doing, which was to follow up what the Germans had left behind, uh, pick up uh, the technical work that they had left behind, bring it back for analysis and some place to work on it and uh, analyze what uh, results they'd been getting, regardless of what it was, as long as it was signal equipment, in other words, radio, uh, radar, or any of that. We had uh, information that some uh, strange thing had been happening with the planes of the uh, Eighth Air Force or Ninth Air Force, uh, and that is that uh, when they would fly near Frankfurt, their engines would falter. Now, some people said this was a rumor, and other people said it's a reality. But anyway, they had noticed that near Frankfurt on the north side, there was this hill, fairly high, or almost a mountain, and up on the top of it was this wooden tower. And uh, people thought that must be the source of all this, whatever it is that's affecting the engines. And um, so a number of different teams went there to investigate it. But uh, from our group, uh, another man and I went there with a driver. We always drove our own cars to these things. And uh, so we went into Frankfurt, and uh, not all the way in, but before you get to Frankfurt, you turn off and you went up this road, up this mountain. And when we got up there, uh, we found that it was, it was mysterious, and we never did find the answer to that. I didn't anyhow, and I never heard later what the story really was. But the tower was uh, all enclosed, wooden tapered tower, and it had levels all the way up. You go up a flight of stairs and then another one and so on. And whatever had been in there had all been stripped out and it was all gone. But they could not take out the power supply, which was underground, two enormous diesel engines. The, um, they were with the generators that were on the end of them. They were probably about as long as from the end of that curtain over to that one over there. And there were two of these side by side, just sitting there underground. Now, what were they for? We never did find out. But in the course of wandering around in this tower, I got talking to a British officer who was there from the British Army. For the same and, reason. Hmm? He was there for the same reason. Uh, yes, he was there for the same purpose. And um, before it was over, we uh, both found out that we were interested in audio and were comparing notes about it. And... Um, he said, have you ever heard these machines that the Germans have that they're using in their radio stations? And I said, no. He said, well, it's a tape recorder. It's a, uh, and I described, does it look like this or that? Now, we'd had a number of these machines sent to our office in Paris by different teams, and we had checked them, and they performed very poorly. I mean, if you ever heard the playback off of one of those machines and compared it to a 78 RPM shellac record at the time. You'd select the shellac record. You wouldn't uh, ever want to hear this tape again. It had a lot of background noise and it had high distortion. And so um, I thought this guy said that this sounds marvelous. He heard it down here in Radio Frankfurt, but he probably has a tin ear because the way he described it, it's the same machines we've been seeing brought into us and uh, they certainly aren't any high fidelity by any means. So um, <clears throat> he said, why don't you go down there and hear them anyway? And uh, we parted company, and I really owe a lot to that man because uh, on the way down, we were going to go back to Paris at the bottom of the hill. If I turned right, I would have been back in Paris that night, late at night, 
If I turned left, I would go to Radio Frankfurt. And coming down the hill, I was trying to decide which way to go. And I thought the guy was crazy, and I decided, well, let's take a chance on it and turn left. And uh, within a half hour or so, I was in this little town called Bad Nauheim. The Radio Frankfurt operation had moved out to this town because of the bombings in Frankfurt. And so this is where their studios were. They'd taken over a big old house and were just using the rooms in the house for their equipment. But they'd moved all the apparatus out there and they used the living room as a studio. So it was a pretty rugged operation. And that had been taken over by the Armed Forces Radio Service because now this was all in the hands of the Americans and uh, any radio broadcasting was done for the benefit of the GIs, the heck with the, uh, the um, natives. And so it was under control of army officers, but the staff was, were German and they were operating the whole thing. And uh, I went in and uh, saw the officer and I asked him if he had these tape machines that they used on the air and he said, oh yes. And I said, could I hear one of them? And he said, okay. So he took me in and sat me down in a room and he clapped his hands a couple of times or something and a, a German uh, attendant came and clicked his heels and went off and put on a roll of tape on this machine in the back room and I, all I heard was a loudspeaker in front of me and I couldn't believe it. I'd never heard anything like that in my life before. This was the great revolution as far as I was concerned. It was a symphonic orchestra. I couldn't hear any background noise and uh, it was going out the loudspeaker, I suppose, was limited away on the top end, but it was going out probably to about 10,000 cycles and very clean, no distortion that I was able to hear. And in those days, I think I had a pretty good ear. So anyway, uh, I um, looked and here was these machines in the back room um, that looked exactly like the things that had been sent to our office in Paris. And so I thought, well, maybe there's a possibility of converting one of those if I get enough information. So man I was with had a camera and we photographed the instruction manuals right there, which were in German, and the schematic diagrams of the electronics. And I couldn't wait to get back to Paris. And the first thing I did when I had the opportunity was take one of those machines that we had laying around and uh, make up electronics to this circuit and modify um, some of the uh, construction in the heads because the race head was not suitable. And we tried this and it worked just like the stuff that I'd heard. Beautiful. Amer American, you had all American tubes that you used in the... Uh, yes, we, we used our own uh, components we had. Just like the machine that's on display next door is uh, American, uh, American <coughs> tubes, the electronics are made up by you and the German transport. Right. So, um, as soon as the war was over and we were about to come home, we had a lot of these things laying around and I thought, well, uh, as souvenirs of war, I can't think of anything nicer for me than a pair of these machines. Just the mechanisms now, mind you, that was all. I didn't care about electronics because I could make that up when I got home. And that's what I did. But of course I needed tape too. And there were a number of uh, rolls of this stuff laying around that had been sent in. And I picked up every one of those that I could. And on two occasions I went down to Nuremberg once and I went to uh, I can't remember Frankfurt or Stuttgart or something, and I stopped in there and I asked them if they could uh, slip me two or three of these rolls, and by the time I was finished, I had 50 rolls of this tape. Well, the tape uh, rolls, uh, the, now these tapes ran at 30 inches per second. I'm sure you may be familiar with that idea that the first machines ran fast at 30 inches. And um, so they ran for only 22 minutes per roll. So if you're going to run a half hour or something, you needed at least two of them. Um, so I sent home 50 rolls and I sent the two machines home. And when I got home to San Francisco, I got out of the taxi that took me home from the train station and um, rang the doorbell and my mother came. The first thing she says is, my God, you're bald. The second thing I said is, uh, how many packages came here? And she said something like 18, which is what it was. Because I had to take these machines all apart to put them through the mail. 
Anyway, um, I got back home and I got the stuff out and I put it together and uh, made myself a pair of these machines that worked and I did uh, my testing on them. I had no test gear really to set anything up. Uh, I knew that the Germans had recorded constant current characteristic on the uh, record circuitry out to and uh, expecting to get to 10,000 cycles, but above that they didn't care. They, everything dropped off above 10,000. Now, um, I hoped that I could get this thing to go out farther because the new thing was to try to go to 15,000 cycles on super fidelity stuff. So I uh, introduced uh, pre-emphasis in the record characteristic, uh, starting at about 1,000 cycles and rising, and I kept working on this and pushing it out, and I got it out to 15,000. I did have an oscillator, but I didn't have anything else for test purpose uh, to permit uh, testing, and I think I had a, 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 a VT, not a VTVM, but a, a no meter for uh, reading levels. You had, you had 78 uh, scratch, scratch. Well, I'm going to get into that. Yeah. The easiest thing that I found uh, to adjust the machines was that, first of all, I provided an A-B switch where I could go from input to output as I recorded, because these had simultaneous playback, erase, record, and playback heads. And so I... Um, established the record current on a, a rising characteristic and then I wanted to equalize the system flat overall and the way I uh, did that not having adequate test gear was to take a 78 rpm record and let the needle run on the inside closed groove uh, hour after hour and um, record this and play it back and a b it until it sounded identical on playback as it did on the input. So this was my signal source for alignment of playback to input. And believe me, it's not bad if you're in a hurry to do, uh, get a, a, a match of the playback to the record side. You can do it that way because the scratch goes way, way out if you have a good pickup and it also goes way, way down because that somebody thump uh, has got a lot of lows in it from a... Uh, <laughs> and, and that's how I aligned it, and it was the only way I aligned it, and then I gave demonstrations of this thing, and um, uh, we recorded... By now, I was associated with a man by the name of Bill Palmer in San Francisco who ran a film studio, film recording and uh, film processing, all film services, mostly 16 millimeter. He and I had been friends from the time we went to school. And uh, so I went to work with him instead of going back to work for the phone company. And uh, uh, right away we found we could record all the original material on the magnetophone tape, then select takes and transfer them to film. So I guess we were the first people to use magnetic recording for film work in this country too. And um, while we were doing this kind of operation, in 1946, oh, incidentally, we came down here for the SMPE convention in October, and Bill said, why don't we throw one of the machines in the car? And I said, well, all right. So we came down with it, and uh, we attended a session in which we met Marvin Cameras, who was talking on uh, magnetic recording, and uh, since this was the motion picture engineer's uh, convention, he had... Um, converted an old uh, sound head, 35 millimeter, uh, by putting a magnetic head on it and uh, coat, uh, striping a, uh, about 100 feet of film with his black oxide. And uh, first I understood he put it on with a paintbrush, but I've been later told that that was stretching it a little far. But anyway, uh, he had recorded music on that and he played it at the convention and there were a lot of raised eyebrows about that. They thought that was pretty good. Well, there was a man uh, with us uh, who, uh, Art Crawford of Crawford's of Beverly Hills. Man has now passed away, but he ran this super shop out there in Beverly Hills for the uh, uh, trade, the carriage trade. And uh, he uh, had the Cape Heart Agency, among other things, and uh, a very fine shop and a, a nice record shop and so forth. And uh, he knew all the engineers, the head engineers in all the studios, and of course a lot of the artists and so forth. And uh, he was there, and we got talking with him, and uh, Bill told him that we had this machine in the 
because we got talking about magnetic recording, obviously, and Bill let him know that we had this machine and he wanted to see it and we showed it to him and he says, I've got to call uh, um, Tom Moulton out at uh, Fox Studios and uh, Douglas Shearer at uh, MGM and so on. I've got to let them see this. This is sensational. So he set up these appointments and took us around from one studio to the other where we uh, would record something that they were doing on a set and uh, play it back to them. And uh, it was interesting the different reactions you got from people. Um, Yours so, was the first time anybody had really ever heard or seen of seen that technology. That's Megan. right. Uh, none of these people had ever witnessed it before. We heard very shortly afterward that they got an edict from Westrex that if they were considering getting into anything with this new magnetic medium thing, that Westrex would pull out all their equipment because this was all under lease, you know. So they were very good boys and they stayed with Optical until they all had some kind of understanding on this thing. This all occurred in October. But in May of 1946, we gave our first demonstration to the Institute of Radio Engineers in San Francisco and I had recorded a lot of material from a local station, KFRC up there, and uh, orchestra and pipe organ and uh, things of that sort. And we used that for demo. And it went over very well. The demonstration was given in the NBC building up there. And uh, there were a number of people there. One of them was a man by the name of Harold Lindsay, who liked the sound of a little portable loudspeaker I had to demonstrate this stuff. Pony Ponyatoff like, was the one who, who was really intrigued with the oh, loudspeaker. Oh, yes, yeah. OK. Alex Ponyatoff was interested in this. And uh, they didn't know that what I had done was put pre-emphasis on the bottom end to help push the bottom up and make it sound like it had some real bass in it. But anyway, uh, they found that out by the fact that they were so interested, they contacted us and wanted to look into a possible manufacture of this loudspeaker and uh, came and talked about it. And that led us into further talks about the magnetic tape and whatnot. Uh, we had made a tentative arrangement with the Colonel Ranger that I told you earlier um, uh, was getting into the manufacture of a machine and uh, we were to represent him on the West Coast, that is Bill Palmer and I. Um, if he made a machine, we would like to sell it. We didn't want to get into that. We weren't cut out for manufacturing. So we were reluctant to tell anybody anything much about the magnetophone uh, because we were trying to protect Colonel Ranger. But uh, Ponyatoff and, uh, uh, was coming down to this convention and uh, Harold Lindsay, I guess, uh, uh, suggested that uh, we let him hear it down here at the Hollywood Hotel. And so we got together and he heard it and he was very impressed and he went back home to this little company called Ampex that had been making motors during the war for aircraft and now didn't know what to do except that they were all interested in high fidelity and wanted to make a turntable or a, a, uh, a loudspeaker or something in the field and didn't know quite which way to go. And uh, Alex went back home and said he thought that uh, they ought to get into the tape business. And that was the start of Ampex's interest in it. Now, as I say, we did not want to give Ampex any information because we were protecting Ranger. And this went on until the summer of 1947, uh, when um, Bill and I were using it in our business up there, the film business. And this man came up from Hollywood who had need for uh, some special work, and we were doing it for him. And he heard this, and he said, this sounds like something Bing Crosby could use in Los Angeles because they've been doing their program on records, and uh, they haven't liked the quality, and this sounds so great, I'll bet they could uh, uh, go for this. Uh, uh, can I set up a, an appointment uh, for you to get in touch with them if I go back down, when I go back down? And we said, well, okay, you know, we didn't think much about that. And he did that and uh, arranged for Bill and me to come down and demonstrate uh, to Murdo McKenzie, who was the technical producer of the Bing Crosby radio show, what this uh, um, technique could do. And uh, now it uh, was not only the world's best recording system, but it was also a slick way of editing. Because I had learned uh, from our experience up there how I could cut and splice tape. We had only two machines now, remember, so that editing 
only could consist of cutting and splicing. You couldn't cross fade because that takes three machines. You have to have two to play tapes on and one to record on. So everything had to be done with scissors and sticky tape. And I had developed pretty good technique along those lines. So actually, Ponytoff came down to the Hollywood Hotel to see this machine that he'd heard about. And that's yeah. what convinced him to uh, get Ampex into, into tape recording. What did you and Bill do then? Did you think you were going to go back to San Francisco and uh, well, we become just thought, tape moguls? Or what? We just thought we'd had a lot of fun taking this around to the studios, you know, <laughs> and, and letting him really hear something. And we had. And um, so we went back home and we continued to use it uh, on this work that we were doing. Now, you see, that was October 46, and it was uh, early 47. The Crosby people heard about this demonstration and invited me to come to Los Angeles to demonstrate it. The result was that I never got back to San Francisco because it sounded so great that they wanted me to go right to work for them. And I did. And this is the machine, one of the pair of two that I had. And I'm going to let you hear the kind of thing that it was capable of doing. The little piece of tape that I'm going to play on here was actually recorded in 1947 when I went to work for Bing Crosby to do his radio show. And it still sounds as good as it ever did. Hey, uh, Jerry, uh, what are we sweeping up the studio for? Bing Crosby is coming back on the air tonight. Hiya, fellas. Well, Bing, hey, hello. Oh, welcome home. Hey, wait, thanks. I live and breathe. Here's my guitar player, Perry Bodkin. What are you doing over at that mic? And what am I doing over here? <laughs> Perry Big Body. Ad lib, I'll get over there in a minute. <laughs> Where the blue of the night meets the gold of the day someone waits for me not you anyway that gives you an example of the kind of fidelity that this system was capable of and so when I came along with this it was a sensation and I immediately put it to work for them uh, Bing said uh, what are you going to do if uh, one of these machines breaks down? And I said, well, I think we have that taken care of because some of those people that had been at that demonstration I gave in San Francisco on May 16, 1946, had decided by now that they wanted to make an equivalent of this machine here in America. And they were the first to produce a tape recorder that performed with the fidelity of these machines. Imagine now, these were the only two in the United States that performed with such fidelity. And when they came out, this was the end product. This is the first model of the Ampex 200, which even today, uh, I uh, don't think anybody will deny what I've always said about it as the most beautiful tape recorder ever made. It's like a piece of furniture with black lacquered cabinet, and even the electronics is good looking. The top is stainless steel and it performs, you won't hear it here, but it runs and performs as well as the magnetophone, as that is called. So this is the machine that put Crosby on tape. And so with the introduction of this Model 200 Ampex tape recorder, which occurred in April of 1948, the whole recording industry went through a vast transformation. And the results are something like this, where it opened the field to a vast uh, a floodgate of new equipment all based on magnetic recording. I got those first Ampex tape recorders which replaced my little German machines in April of 1948 but in order to uh, continue that it was necessary for us to actually open a little laboratory and Bing Crosby backed that and it became the electronics division of Bing Crosby Enterprises. A well-known man here in town by the name of Wayne Johnson also joined us in this venture and the two of us started working on the prospect of video recording. We gave a demonstration of the first video tape ever to reproduce a picture on a television screen in 1951 and we progressed from there on for several years in the development of this at Bing Crosby Enterprises. 
Well, um, he, I said, if we could work together, would you like to come to work for Bing Crosby Enterprises? And if we could get some money from Bing, uh, get this thing going. And he said he'd sure, sure would like to do that. So I went to Bing and uh, managed to get $100,000 from him. And uh, that furthered this cause. And we immediately got in the project. Now, the first thing we did, uh, Frank Healy, our uh, hotshot manager of our electronics division, wanted to know how quick we could give a demonstration to somebody. The first attempt was very crude. We tried to use a head, uh, one of the normal heads, by ripping all the, ca the uh, coils off of it and putting on a very few turns to try to get the inductance down, and uh, then pump that uh, with a TV signal, uh, full everything, vertical, horizontal sync, the whole works, and then uh, play it back and lock up a, a monitor tube with it. And uh, that seemed to work. We got the thing to have a, the face of the tube was filled with gray. That was OK. It meant that there was vertical and horizontal sweep. And uh, so then we uh, started sticking a signal into that from a TV uh, tuner. and. Uh, on playback, you saw these very strange shadowy figures. And so Frank Healy was delighted. Here was picture off a tape, the first people in the world to do it. And so he contacted Variety and the Hollywood Reporter and have these people come out. <laughs> and they were there, believe me. <laughs> and I've got stacks of publicity that started at that time in 1951 with his first demonstration. And I can still remember that first one where these guys are sitting there waiting for this. And we start the machine up. And here comes up all this, this noise and everything and this kind of a gray thing moves across and goes up like that. And Frank says, before it started, Frank says, now watch this airplane take off. And that's what, <laughs> just a shadowy gray thing go off the edge of the picture. But there it was, it was a picture. <laughs> During all this period, Ampex, who we were still in business with, were working on their approach to TV recording. We knew well, nothing about what was going on up there, except that they did tell us they had a project, but it wasn't very good. They weren't getting anywhere with it. And finally, I was invited one time to go up there in 1955. And lo and behold, that was it. I came back and I said, all right, it's all over. I mean, they've got it because they had the, they really had it good. The spinning head, you had a fixed head. Yep, the spinning head and FM. Uh, anyway, I came back and we talked it over and talked to Bing and uh, it was decided that uh, it was all over as far as the Bing Crosby Enterprises uh, electronics division was concerned. But we had made some instrumentation machines of outstanding performance that went out to a megacycle or more. Based high on that speed, same design. Uh, yeah, high speed tape from what we had learned about that. And we had learned how to get the flutter way down by this tight loop drive, which was uh, very good, using a small capstan and a small reversing idler and putting the heads very close in there. The flutter could be very, very fine indeed. In the course of progression along in this development of video recording, we had developed what we call a tight loop drive. It consists of a capstan against which the tape is pressed as it comes in. It goes around an idler and then goes out and is pressed to the capstan on the way out. This isolates the tape in a small loop. And this is an ideal place to mount the heads to reduce flutter and wow to the absolute minimum. And this development uh, took place in our laboratory in that period from 1950 to 55. Well, when Bing wanted to sell the organization, no longer being interested in the development of videotape, he sold it to 3M Company. And it became known as the MinCom division of 3M Company. And we continued on then as uh, a part of the 3M organization. This machine here is a development we made and introduced about 1965. It is a professional audio tape machine, and it achieved a great deal of popularity. After the introduction of electric recording, the phonograph manufacturers and record manufacturers found a slight increase in their business. And it gradually increased and grew. And um, records were an enormous success and a big business, which they've remained ever since. But along the way, there was a time about 1931 and 32 when people said, OK, we've got to buy a new radio phonograph. And uh, 
The cream of all this was the Capehart machine, if you could afford it. Now remember, this was coming out of the Depression, which hit 1929, and a lot of people didn't have much money. But by 1932, the Capehart people introduced cabinets that contained this record changer, and it was the Cadillac of, of phonographs. You could buy a Cape Heart that could cost up to two or three thousand dollars in those days, and that was a lot of money. But this record changer turns the records over and will play them intermixed, 10 and 12 inch. It doesn't discriminate. It's perfectly happy with either. I've arranged it here so it changes so that you can witness it. It doesn't wait and play through an entire record. Well, anyway, uh, that uh, was the wonderful things that happened to the phonograph and uh, has re have remained with us. But through all this and all the complexity and high technological development that has resulted, we can still go back to the most basic fundamental things and come up with a phonograph that costs five cents. And this is it. And here's what you do with it. You open this up like that. You take the little record out of its sleeve. You put it on what may be called a spindle. And you put this down here. Then you reach for your pen. And the record has a special hole in it. And you do this. Por otra parte, usted tiene que reconocer que este mundo no tiene nada que pueda borrar el teclado. And when you've had the message, you just fold it up, and there you go. So that about covers the field of recording. Where do we go from here? We get more complicated, and we get simpler. That's about as simple as I think you can ever get. But where do the complications take us? Who knows? Where do we go from here in the art of sound reproduction?